organize these events, and hopefully you're finding these informative and helpful to you, and of course keeping up with the weather. Today we kind of take a little bit of a turn. We look a lot more forward into the future today, and also in the short term too probably, as Paul has some satellite imagery up. Um, but I'm very happy to have Paul Knight, a great friend to the briefings over the years, always provides some long-term forecasting and sometimes short-term uh, for the briefings. So, Paul, thanks for coming. Okay. Thanks, Dan, and uh, thank you for coming by today on a day where the weather is, is anything but interesting in our part, although I guess there could be a couple of showers and thunderstorms uh, late this afternoon. I put the satellite picture up here to give you some sense of uh, how things are looking right now. There's one terrific cyclone uh, currently spinning up in the western plains. Whoa, uh, that's going away. So let's see if we can get back here. Um, nope. I think it was in the other path. There we go. Well, we got a lot of stuff going on here. Yep. Oh, we moved over. Pardon me. As, uh, as Dan said, uh, could we use the, the climate office uh, uh, laptop today? <laughs> Uh, this this laptop is mine, so it's not the climate office. Um, I always hate when this thing happens. There we go. That was easy. Um, yeah, this uh, this storm has has produced a a significant amount of rain in the places that normally don't get very much rain. And in fact, Rapid City had their second wettest day of record in September, uh, with about two and a half inches of rain. And there are large areas of um, of the Western High Plains that have had uh, anywhere from one to three inches, all the way from northeastern Colorado up into parts of central parts of uh, South Dakota. In fact. Those in the forecasting class understand why we chose the places we did. We were forecasting for Pierre, South Dakota, uh, which is right here, and also for Williston, North Dakota. So two, uh, two of the garden spots of the High Plains um, are where we're forecasting. And, and the loop shows it very well that this is a well-wound-up storm, in fact, maybe the m most uh, intense one of the early season. Not very much severe weather with it, although I did receive a picture from my daughter. I'm not sure if I'm, if I'm still logged on here. Anyway, uh, she lives in Centennial, Colorado, and noted that, and sent me pictures this morning, that they had uh, one to two inch hailstones that just decimated their roof. <laughs> um, so it's, uh, they have thatched roof, and it just looks awful. Uh, and in fact, the plows had to come out in some of the suburbs of Denver, Centennial, Littleton, to be able to clear the roads because there was so much hail. Um, so and that's all part of this, uh, this cyclone, which really is not going to have any uh, profound effect on us anytime soon. Uh, if anything, it'll just kind of slow down the, uh, the, the big cool down, or just a little bit. Um, what I really want to do today is, I guess we can take a look at the, uh, just a, a gander at what's going on. Do I have to hold this thing? Yeah. yeah you don't have well, I do. Um, uh, it's kind of, you know... It's kind of like doing a song and dance here at the same time. Let's just take a, a gander at the at the GFS today and see where where things are expected to be. That cyclone goes. Uh, I'll just talk loud so you can hear me there on the table. Um, it goes up into North Dakota and then right up in, toward Lake Winnipeg. Um, meanwhile, here we stay in this quasi blocking pattern. Although there's this little disturbance that's uh, that comes underneath and is the one that could give a few showers uh, to parts of the western half of the state today, and again, a few around tomorrow. Uh, interesting point to note is that the rainfall in Pennsylvania during September has been exceptionally low, and many of the climate divisions uh, are averaging between one and two inches below normal. And I think it's probably going to be the driest September since 1984 uh, in, in the state and which will rank it probably among the top 10 driest of record. Uh, but that, that aside, uh, that's, of course, that's history. The, the month ended at 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock this morning, at least uh, in terms of the record keeping. So even though if it does rain today, it won't count. It'll count into October's rainfall. So there's the, there's the low going up uh, tomorrow. This is 18Z tomorrow. If we continue to uh, watch it along and see there's another disturbance that comes out of the southern plains, 
that will make for interesting forecasting uh, in Meteorology 415 for, say, Des Moines, hint, hint. Um, and then uh, that is the one that, uh, that finally pulls the full latitude trough uh, eastward and sends a, uh, a very strong cyclone up into the Great Lakes and eventually up into James Bay and drags a front through Pennsylvania that will probably be the change of season front. Um, uh, we've had several opportunities to get it warm and I think after this, it may get mild again, but I think uh, what we're enjoying right now is the end of the line with regard to, to warmth. Because by the time we get to, um, this is Saturday morning, the front is passed, uh, and it uh, looks like the, there'll be a, this may be a classic case uh, of a narrow cold frontal rain band that could produce, you know, locally one to three inches of rain. So that will eradicate any of the dryness that's set in from September. Uh, and then it goes sweeping by, and we get into uh, sub-540 uh, thickness. Now, only under ideal conditions would it be that there will be any, um, any frost with this. Uh, I don't think it looks quite right. This is 0 Z. This is uh, 8 o'clock in the evening on Saturday. And by the time we get to Sunday morning, uh, 114 hours or 120 hours, um, it doesn't look like we'll have enough to, uh, time to get the winds to calm down. So even though the, the, the temperature, 850, will be probably uh, in the upper 20s or low 30s Fahrenheit, I don't think it'll translate down to the ground in terms of, uh, of that chilly. Although the high grounds of northwestern Pennsylvania will probably get uh, very close to freezing, but there it'll be either uh, scattered or broken clouds. And that goes by, and then we just get into a, a fairly fast flow. Another disturbance comes ripping along. And by the way, this may be kind of a, a precursor of what we'll see in the early part of the uh, autumn and, uh, and mid-autumn time uh, with the reinforcement of chilly air coming in uh, early part of next week. And then that lifts out. And after that, it does look like we'll get some relaxation with more of a zonal flow eventually setting up. Uh, but that's, that's kind of the immediate issue. The, so the, the word is that uh, uh, in the short term, which I really didn't look all that much detail of because I was forecasting in the plains, uh, um, but the, there could very well be a uh, thunder shower uh, this evening or late this afternoon or evening. I hope it comes later because I rode my bicycle um, and I'd rather not get wet. Um, and, uh, and then that goes by and there'll be some instability clouds around tomorrow. But really, the most part, from now until the front arrives on Friday, late Friday afternoon or Friday evening, is uh, it's going to be on the mild side, uh, albeit not as warm as it was over the weekend. And uh, the timing of this front is actually looks rather annoying for high school football games um, because it looks like it's the drenching will begin just about the time of kickoff uh, at some of the uh, some of the local events and. Uh, Maybe it'll hold off. If anything, there's been a tendency for it to be slightly slower, and that is oftentimes the case with a full latitude trough. Things tend to move along a little bit slower. So perhaps it will be able to squeeze out some of these classic rivalries that are going on in high school football this weekend, uh, Friday night. Um, anyway, that's, uh, that's all I'm going to say about the short term, because it gets cold uh, over the weekend, and then it stays kind of chilly for at least several days. Um, I did want to talk uh, more specifically about the to uh, longer range forecasting and I think that there's opportunity for us to see how things have been going uh, during the past uh, couple of, of months. This is what the CFS forecast was uh, for the summertime for temperature and this is what actually verified. So the cool areas were where it was cool. Uh, it did predict a warmth in Oklahoma and parts of the southern plains which wasn't quite in the same right location. But no widespread coolness, as was actually the case. The warmth they did get in the far west. Um, as far as the interesting part about this, my colleagues in the climate sphere uh, were kind enough to send along the, the divisional maximum and minimum temperatures. And the characteristic of the summer coolness was primarily because of cool maxes, uh, not because of necessarily very chilly mins. And that's noted by the colors here. The blues would indicate uh, much below average uh, max temperatures in the Mississippi Valley. And in part, that's, that's why there'll be such a bumper crop of, of uh, different grains, you know, both corn and also soybeans. Because cool days, not bad. You know, uh, cool nights, not so good. But the nights were actually fairly close to seasonal levels. Um, now, as far as the summer rainfall, 
this was the forecast from the CFS. Um, this was made uh, back in May for June, July, and August. And uh, it had dry in the, in the southern part of the Mississippi Valley in the southwestern plains. But it had a big area of moist in the, in the Rockies, including parts of the southwest and extending across into the upper Mississippi Valley and also somewhat moist in parts of the uh, Ohio Valley. Uh, rainfall, of course, is just a, you know, it's a, it's a crapshoot in terms of trying to make a, a forecast of it. But, but it, actually, the forecast, to their credit, did catch this wet area in the Rockies. And of course, as we know, it got very wet in parts of the southwest. Uh, did not do so well in the dryness in the south, except to say that there was a patch of dryness in south Texas and also some dryness in the interior southeast, which was not picked up very well. So that was the forecast there. So far be it for me to not also pick on the Farmer's Almanac, uh, which I will do uh, several times. Um, this was the forecast made for summer of 2014 last year, uh, and it just said hot everywhere, essentially. It was one cool uh, to normal precipitation up here, and that's actually one of the areas that was warm this summer. <laughs> um, so essentially, you know, uh, for spending seven bucks for that uh, uh, paper last year, it wasn't really worth it in terms of the, the quality of the forecast here because it was a cool summer um, and it did not predict a cool summer, which just tells you that you can't do that sort of stuff. You can't make those sort of forecasts. Um, now here's the autumn so far. The CFS predicts uh, for September, October, November, of course we've, we're one-third of the way through, warmth in the west and very much no signal at all uh, once we get east of the Rockies. And so far this is just a third of it done, so I'm not any means trying to hold it to any standard. But September, at least as of yesterday, uh, was cool in the middle part of the country. And we were kind of wavering back and forth. Now that we had two mild days, we'll probably end up a few tenths of a degree above normal here in Pennsylvania. But the warmth was in the west, and that, that's kind of an easy message to get. Um, but the rest of it was really not all that clear. Rainfall, September, October, November. Again, we're only a third of the way through. But it certainly picked up on the idea that it was going to be quite wet in parts of the uh, uh, southwest and southern Rockies. And that has been the case in places. Of course, the uh, two storms, Norbert and um, uh, what was the other one? Was that? Odile, yeah. Uh, really uh, uh, dumped uh, some good rains in this part of the country. Uh, but it, it's interesting to note it was, it, the indications are some dryness in the mid Atlantic region and parts of the southeast which we're only a third through, but it is starting to show up at least in part. So, um, which brings me to announce um, uh, a new center that we're, we're starting here in the, uh, which is the Center for, center for Responsible and Accurate Predictions, because uh, God knows that there isn't a lot of that. Um, uh, and the mission is, uh, and so it has, you know, CRAP, so you can send us your crap and we'll see it gets disposed of. And the strategy is to expose crap for what it really is. Um, so uh, the craft casting has these premises. Uh, you make predictions that are, are difficult to verify. Boast when you're correct and forget when you're wrong. Uh, as often as possible, predict opposite scenarios very close to one another. And when egregious errors are, are made, uh, self-flagellation is permitted. Okay. So here's, here's uh, the Crap Hall of Fame is going to take the, the Farmer's Almanac forecast for next summer, because this is summer of 2015. Um, and look at this. Uh, this is true crap. Uh, uh, cool, cool and dry with hot and dry and hot and normal precip on either side. You know, I mean, how, how can you not be wrong? If, if you, one or the other happens, you'll say we predicted that. So, so this, is just, uh, this is just absolute nonsense that is still purported to actually have some value and some people really believe it does. By the way, it looks, uh, once again, in this, you'll see other than for a few pockets of cool, there's really no indication of, uh, of it's going to be hot again next summer. So if at first you don't succeed, try again. Um, now here, here's the Kraft Weekly winner, uh, and I'm picking on the, the, in this case, the Canadian model, which of course is, is predicted probably about 40 uh, tropical cyclones uh, so far this, uh, this year. And here, once again, it's predicting another tropical cyclone. This is the forecast from last night uh, for next Monday. So there's a hurricane somewhere in the central Atlantic which, of course, will do nothing uh, since it's blocked by this ridge. So we will have crap weekly winners, but uh, I won't be around to be able to do those all the time. So, All right, let's talk about the serious part of the drivers of seasonal forecasts. So ocean temperature anomalies, you know, is one of the big ones. Atmospheric circulation anomalies are another one. And certainly surface-driven effects, such as albedo changes, are pretty important, too. 
So here's the, uh, the main player that everybody likes to uh, herald as far as the important part of a, uh, of a seasonal anomaly, and that is ENSO, or the uh, sea surface temperature anomalies uh, uh, along the equator in the Pacific Ocean. Um, it is certainly the most studied. It may not always be the most important, and that's probably the, the crucial part here is that um, it's been heralded as being the player, and it may or may not be the player, as we'll find out. Um, here's the, uh, the daily sea surface temperature anomalies in, in region 3.4, which is this area uh, that uh, bridges across the dateline, but primarily is on our side of the, uh, the Western Hemisphere. And it has been fairly positive for a while. Uh, there's been some times when it went, went uh, kind of neutral for a time in July, but it remains on the positive side, indicating that we are in a warm episode. Uh, and there you can see the sea surface temperature anomalies are warmer than average across uh, the, the uh, equatorial Pacific. However, you know, when you look at that and you're just looking for colors and things that will massage the eyeballs, um, uh, this is really you know, what is so amazing, is this warmth that has been in the Gulf of Alaska and, uh, and the Bering Sea. Uh, it's just unprecedented. It was there last winter. Uh, it's back in, in, in all last year and it's back again, this has been sufficient enough to actually take the Pacific Decadal Oscillation and at least for a time make it um, positive rather than negative because the flip uh, is arguably occurred in 1999. Um, but uh, this is really quite an astounding feature and may very well be the prominent player with regard to the circulation anomalies in the Northern Hemisphere uh, this winter. So this is what it looks like in a profile. Um, side view, so to speak, of, of the uh, ENSO. Uh, and this is along the equator. This is the depth. Uh, so this is going from somewhere near Indonesia to just off the coast of South America. And this is the, the tilted warm wave, so to speak, the Kelvin wave uh, in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, so there's still plenty of warm water underneath, which leads us to believe that it probably will end up being at least a, a uh, weak, if not moderate, uh, and so, at least when this finally, you know, hits the coast and bounces back. The models, uh, both the dynamic models, which are listed here, and the statistical models, all are in agreement that we are in the positive phase. That's good to see because that's what the data says. <laughs> uh, you know, but we don't want to believe the data because the models say something else. Um, so here, here's the projection. All of them are in the positive, but very few of them get above one degree Celsius, uh, which would mean, which would be the threshold for something uh, more than weak, and uh, and they all kind of run flat. So uh, it looks like a weak ENSO, weak El Nino, is likely to be the case uh, coming up this winter. Now let's talk about atmospheric circulations. Um, and last year we had the honor of having Judah Cohen come and speak to us. Uh, of course, he is one of the uh, the people who is a, a, an authority on the effects of snow cover in uh, Eurasia during the month of October and the effects that has on on the atmospheric circulation pattern in the northern hemisphere for the following winter. Well, there's another guy, uh, and I'm not going to try to pronounce his name, um, but uh, there he is, Vladimir, that, that part I can get. Um, he's at the Long Range Forecasting Division Hydromet Research Center in Moscow. He published this paper in March of this year in the um, the Journal of Climatology, International Journal, Journal of Climatology, and essentially, uh, and there's the details of it, uh, so if you wanted to read it, and I have read it, uh, it's actually pretty interesting, but he looks at a whole different area, and specifically he's looking at the, the Tamar, Tamar uh, uh, circulation anomaly. This is the Tamar Peninsula, uh, and, and by the way, if you're wondering to know where have I heard that before, uh, it's been in the news lately because of all these huge sinkholes that are showing up. Um, so, you know, they're really onto something here in Russia. <laughs> uh, uh, maybe Florida could learn something from them. Um, so here, here's these, uh, uh, the areas of these large sinkholes. This is the region we're looking at, kind of the most northern protrusion of Russia into the uh, Arctic Ocean. And there's a atmospheric circulation anomaly that occurs in this region that uh, he argues is actually as, if, as important, if not more important, than what happens uh, with regard to what uh, Cohen has said. Um, essentially, and I'll give you the key takeaways rather than all the specifics, is that his point is that a, during October, which is not yet, um, a strong Icelandic low, that is a low that has lower than 1,000 millibars mean pressure for the month, uh, and a weak Siberian high with pressures around 1022 millibars 
correlate well with a negative uh, Arctic oscillation for December, January, and February. He says it's counterintuitive, which it is to me, too. Um, and also, he says, above normal sea surface temperatures in the Laptiv Sea, and the Laptiv Sea is, let's go back here, uh, this is the Laptiv Sea over here, uh, it are correlated uh, with a blocking ridge at 300 millibars um, around 74 north and 98 east, and that signals also a negative AO during the wintertime. So this is the region. These, these are the current sea surface temperature anomalies as of yesterday. Uh, and this is the area we're looking at. That's the region that his correlations show the greatest connection between that during the month of October. Of course, this is September 28th. Um, and it's kind of interesting stuff. So uh, now this is what Cohen was speaking about. He spoke more about the increased Eurasian snow cover uh, during the month of October and how that ended up help, helping to develop um, an upward energy flux that created uh, some uh, stratospheric polar vortex weakens, and the result is that we have a negative Arctic oscillation, more likely in the latter half of the winter than the beginning of the winter. Um, and this is the uh, uh, note from Judah Cohen's work. Actually, he updated it with a publication in 2012. So just talking about with AO, negative AO, and all that sort of thing. Well, it's a measure of the of the strength of the westerlies uh, around the hemisphere, the northern hemisphere, because there's an AAO too, an Antarctic uh, oscillation. And uh, when the AO is negative, uh, it's less cold in the stratosphere, but there tends to be more of a uh, of a meridional flow in the um, in the northern hemisphere than a zonal flow, which is more common uh, with a colder stratospheric circulation. Albedo changes. Uh, of course, we're aware of the fact that this is now the um, the sixth least amount of ice, although uh, in the Arctic, although it's been increasing for the past several years since 2012, uh, which is the part that doesn't get uh, get well reported. Uh, what isn't, which is totally neglected by most folks, is the fact that the Antarctic uh, ice is at historically high levels, um, and it's just it's just at a point where, in fact, you may have heard last year. I think it was in around February, uh, or maybe it was uh, late January, that a ship got stuck, a research vessel got stuck in the ice, actually in the very same area where I had the privilege of traveling in 2007, uh, down the, uh, the west side, of, or the west side of the Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, and it was just stuck there for a while. They had to get evacuation, and, uh, and then the, the, the ship they evacuated to it also got stuck. So, so if we're thinking that the Antarctic ice doesn't play a role, maybe it doesn't, but I sure wouldn't count it out in terms of a, a player. Nobody really seems to be able to be able to, to say uh, definitively what role it, it does or does not play. And then there are things such as, for example, the optimal climate normal. OCN uh, is a way of taking out the last 30-year averages and then looking at the trend during the past 10 years for temperature. Precipitation has been generally agreed that the last 15 years is what's important. And we'll look at that in just a minute. So here's the optimal climate normal for temperature, at least for November, December, January, and February. So I've actually added an extra month in there uh, for the period 20, 2000 to 2010. And surprisingly, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a tendency for it to have been cooler in that period during the past 10 years in much of the heartland of the country. Warmer in eastern Canada, uh, but that's been the, the OCN. So if you were just knowing nothing else and just wanting to go with the trend, and you were predicting a four-month period, one would say that the middle of the country uh, should be kind of cool during that time. Now, another way to look at it is, uh, and this is now looking at analogs, what happens when we have a positive ENSO or an El Nino and a very positive AMO? Because the, the Atlantic remains very, very warm uh, relative to long-term averages. So the long-term Atlantic multidecadial oscillation continues rather warm. And this is the distribution of, uh, of above normal temperatures in December, January, and February uh, with the numbers here. Of course, there's only two years, so it doesn't really say an awful lot about that, but there's a tendency for it to be warm. The Atlantic has a huge in impact on both Europe and eastern North America. Another way we can look at it is what about the frequency of, of um, uh, when we have a neutral ENSO. So let's say ENSO starts backing off, um, and we have positive AMO, which we do, and a positive PDO, albeit temporary. So that is the Pacific stays very warm, the Atlantic remains warm, and ENSO fades. Well, there's quite an interesting message here. Now, there's only four years involved in this, but these are the uh, uh, frequency of above normal temperatures. 
the eastern half of the country, east of the Mississippi, does not get warm uh, in winters when that's the scenario. So uh, ENSO is indeed, uh, albeit a secondary effect, will have some important role with regard to the winter temperatures. Another thing that we, we would note is that it's been a very uh, weak Atlantic tropical storm season. This is the, uh, as of yesterday, the count of the accumulated cyclonic, uh, cyclone energy. And indeed, we are in our second year of very, very weak um, ACE. So um, now we have to say, well, well, who knows? Maybe things will change. If you look at the, the work uh, that Klotzbach did uh, with regard to the Madden-Julian oscillation and Atlantic hurricane relationship, uh, we're, we're forecast, according to the, the GFS, uh, the Global Forecast System Ensemble, to be in phase seven or six. And relative to his work, which can be seen here, uh, it's actually a time where there aren't that many storms that develop. So it doesn't look like we're coming into a period that will be able to increase the ACE very much. So what happens when we have back-to-back -back, um, uh, weak ACE seasons? And here are the years, going back into the uh, at least into the 1980s, and the, I only did October, November, and December, but the message, at least for the three months ahead, are warmth here and somewhat wet. So it will turn a wet uh, in the Northeast where we've had one dry month in there. Okay, well, how about the, uh, uh, let's say El Nino becomes the dominant player. Uh, this is the typical El Nino, including the trend with the OCN, uh, in a uh, ENSO event or, or with uh, El Nino, December, January, February, you know, cool in the south, especially the southeast and mid-Atlantic, warm in the northern plains and in the Pacific Northwest, wet east of the Mississippi with some dry patches in the Tennessee Valley, and the snowfall, which everybody really wants to know about, uh, is uh, snowy in a storm track that would kind of be from the southwestern plains, West Texas, uh, up into the northeast. So that's if ENSO becomes the dominant player. Here's what the CFS is, uh, is forecasting for December, January, and February. And the temperature is on the left, the precip on the right. And it's really virtually no message of any consequence uh, in these areas. A little bit of cool shows some weak signal of an ENSO here, and the warmth looks like an ENSO. There's the precipitation, although the precip is not wet east of the Appalachians. It's more wet in the southwest in California, where they really could use it anyway. Um, this is the ECMWF outlook. Um, which if I tell you how I got it, I'd have to kill you. Um, but uh, uh, this is the one that was made in September for December, January, and February. Temperature anomalies, or the uh, this is the probability of temperatures being um, above normal, being in the reds, below in the blues. And warmth at, uh, in December, not much of a message in, in January in the northeast, and then mildly above normal in, in February. And as far as the precipitation is concerned, uh, it's just piecemeal, but no, no widespread dry areas until we get to January in the northern Rockies, and then that fades with just patches of dry and wet, so not much of a message there. Uh, of course, here's the, far the Farmer's Almanac forecast, um, which is predicting a very cold winter, uh, and it could be. Heck, you know, it was right last year. Um, uh, east of the Rockies, but it is cold everywhere, and there's patches that are going to be snowy and patches that are not, uh, so take that for what it's worth. They are in the Crap Hall of Fame, so I remember that, too. So uh, the summary is the following, that, that uh, we have to give credence to the fact that we are in a long-term warming trend, <laughs> so that if we knew nothing else, uh, it would be wise to at least consider the fact that uh, you know, winters have been warmer than normal. Uh, but back-to-back -back cold winters do happen. Um, we had that in 92, 93, 93, and 94. Uh, we had it in 77, 78, 79. Uh, so uh, 63, 64, uh, these are winters, uh, and there, there are numerous other cases where two winters in a row, and if we learn anything from our, our neighbors in the United Kingdom and over, overseas, um, they had a whole string. They had four or five winters in a row that were pretty cold. So, so it's clear that that can happen, and maybe it will. Uh, but another cold winter would certainly buck the, the ENSO trend. So if we're going for a... a weak to moderate El Nino, then it probably would not necessarily say it would be all that cold. It may be wet and snowy. Uh, but maybe we'll go for kind of a, a blend, which is to say it's time for us to have some wide swings in the winter. That is, we'll go for, you know, it'll be very warm for periods and it'll be very cold for periods. And in the end, it'll probably average slightly above normal, uh, which, is, which is kind of what happened in September here. 
Um, and, uh, you know, when that happens, though, especially in an area the size of, of the continent of the U.S. and the, the, our, our area, uh, it usually also signals a dry winter because you can't get those sort of wide swings without, without, with a lot of precipitation. And um, that's all I'm going to say. around with the mic so that you can talk and everyone can hear you online. Very important. Questions? Oh. With the very warm water over the Pacific, <coughs> reinforce again the pattern with the ridge over Alaska and a trough over the east in the winter, if that persists? Um, Steve, I think, I think that is a real possibility. And I think that I'll be looking carefully during the month of October to see whether or not there's also a ridge reflected um, in, as we go probably from wave five where we're in right now to wave maybe three by late October. If that other ridge ends up being at the Tymere Peninsula, uh, then I'd say you know at, at 74 north and, and 98 east, yeah, I think we're, we're looking at a negative a, uh, AO, which would be favoring what you just described. Other questions? Can you come forward? I have so much cord. Um, there is a slide um, that, that was shown before that showed the tendency of temperature over the last 10 years or so, um, which showed cooling in the United States um, and warming in Northeast Canada. Could that possibly be related to the decline in Arctic sea ice? increasing blocking in, uh, say, the northern Atlantic and forcing cold air southward? That's an excellent question, and it may very well be part of this um, uh, decreased sea ice. And in, in the fact that it includes the months of November, because rather than just December, January, February, would even lend more credence to that trend. So, yeah, it's a good insight. It could very well be that the, uh, the fact that the ocean, the Arctic Ocean, stays open longer into the beginning of the of the cold season uh, could very well produce a blocking ridge over Quebec or Labrador. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yeah, oh, Fred, question. I don't get to ask him questions very often. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't say I'll answer it. <laughs> uh, but isn't this interesting? I was uh, attracted, of course, to crap casting. Uh, I would spell it with a K, but it wouldn't have the same uh, effect. Oh, going the wrong way. Uh, but in, uh, what I'm interested in is there really, uh, in what you've shown here for the upcoming winter, are a tremendous number of conflicting signals, mm -hmm. right? The, op uh, the optimum climatic normals that we just were looking at, right, are saying that really we're in a cooling trend. You mentioned a long-term warming trend, but certainly there's, uh, for much of the U.S., a 10-year cooling trend. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then we have this ENSO, which uh, going one way, the ridge in the in the uh, in in Alaska suggesting, well, that could be cool. Uh, I noticed that you went uh, wide swings. How does one decide? How does one uh, with all these conflicting signals? And we're going to be hearing. Uh, uh, how do you how do you know what to even say? Well, this you know we know that we can't uh, rely on the old farmer's almanac. Can we, when it comes to seasonal forecasting, can we rely on anything? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I guess it's who, the way we decide what the forecast is is whoever pays the most. <laughs> so if you happen to be in, uh, you know, heating oil, oh, it's going to be a cold winter. Yeah. 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 One of these, uh, one of these uh, things, one above the others. Well, my my gut says cold. Um, because the fact that uh, uh, what w it, I haven't heard a reasonable explanation of what happened in Europe because they're now they've had some very warm winter last winter and they're on their way probably to another warm winter too, so I tend to think that whatever super feature was causing a three four five year uh, cold snap in Europe may very well be uh, <laughs> uh, migrated into our area retrograded into North America, so that would be my gut reaction is cold. And then if, if it's not cold, you know, people might be somewhat disappointed, but they're not as upset as when they forecast a mild winter and ends up being one of the five coldest. 
Uh, so there's a lot of psychology to that as well too. But but I, th I think yeah, what Steve said, the blocking, the the warmth in the North Pacific is ex is just like last year. Um, so granted, last year we were in a neutral phase and so very very weak La Nina. But if this ends up being a weakening uh, uh, El Nino, then why not give all the uh, gusto to this to the ridge in the Pacific over the warm waters? Other questions? I, I have one if no one else. Yep, please. I didn't read the uh, the paper from the, the written by the fellow from Moscow. So is he correlating those conditions at all with sudden stratospheric warmings? Did no. He, he did not. No. No. He did mention them, but he was mentioning a lot of things. There was a very big one. Yeah. Uh, no, his paper did not speak about sudden stratospheric warmings, although it does speak about the fact that uh, this TCA, this uh, this peninsula warming or uh, blocking pattern, um, is related to a a dis uh, disruption of the circulation in the stratosphere over the Arctic. Uh, I have two quick things. So uh, you mentioned the Northern Pacific. You mentioned the Equatorial Pacific. Um, obviously, the Equatorial Pacific is much more well studied. There's a lot of buoys out there. There's a lot of data coming in. Is most of that data that we're getting from the northern Pacific, especially during the cold seasons, satellite derived, or is that some buoys as well? Do you know? Oh no, the Argos uh, project has buoys all across all the oceans. Um, I'm not sure. Last count, I think there was up to around just shy of 5,000 buoys. Um, and uh, whereas the original purpose of the project was to equip the the tropics, uh, no, they're all across the both oceans. Okay. I mean, all the oceans and uh, both hemispheres. Yeah, and given the performance of the climate models for the El Nino predictions, which had not been very good over the last year to year and a half, there was a one point before last winter we thought we were going into a moderate El Nino, and it seemed pretty convincing. Does that give you any pause as to what to believe what El Nino is going to be doing? I really think that the um, the CFS has done a credible job of increasing our ability to see what is coming down the pike with regard to ENSO. Uh, I think it is the best model around. I think it's better than the European Center actually regarding ENSO. Um, whether you know, uh, yeah, when it was forecasting it to be really uh, a moderate event was in that window back in March and April. And that used to be known as the wall, the time when you really couldn't tell there was virtually no skill. Uh, but the fact that that uh, there was some re-engineering of the physics regarding the modeling of, of the oceanic circulations in the CFSV2, uh, that wall apparently has come down. Now, it may have been that it was, it was uh, promoting too warm of an episode. But here we are just literally, you know, um, uh, weeks months away from the event, and it still is warm. It looks warm. So you have to give it credit to sure. say it, call, it called it, albeit a little bit too robust, but it's still maintaining the same signal. Anybody else? Paul, you know, I, I saw an observation I made. If you, uh, You're talking about Antarctic and how the ice is super large. I mean, obviously, that's going to have some ramification. It's it's just got to. It's just such a big ice sheet. But did you ever consider? Uh, we all know that the ozone hole. Uh, we found that it was the isolation of the South Pole because of the shape of the continent and the ice sheet with oceans all around it helped to form those polar stratosphere clouds, right? Mm -hmm. So if we have a warmer ocean in the Pacific, could that be leading to more isolation, which then could be causing a positive feedback for more ice down there? Something to ponder. I mean, it was just something that hit me as I've been looking at it. Um, I wish I knew. I'm I'm uh, I'm not much of a cryospheric person, uh, but but yeah, it it certainly is an interesting idea uh, that you know ultimately all the ice has got to add up to one. You know, <laughs> um, and uh, the loss of it in the Arctic is being compensated for by increasing in the in the Antarctic. Could very well be. I, I don't know. I don't know enough about that because some of these things, I think, Joe, are also related to the deep ocean circulations, which have periods that are, you know, of order of uh, decades, if not centuries. And our our understanding is pretty weak in that domain. So, 
Anything else? Any final questions for Paul? Let's get one more hand. Okay. Thank you. And very quickly, I want to announce next week's speaker is Dave Dombeck from AccuWeather. Uh, Dave is the lead forecasting hiring person at AccuWeather. So if you're an undergraduate student and you want to be involved with forecasting and perhaps want to work here in State College, you know, if you want to come by and see Dave's talk and maybe talk to him afterwards, he enjoys talking to students. So, And he'll be back for the career fair, too, uh, this fall. Thank you. I'm sorry? The link to Tyler, good to see you again.